So, Mark, tell me, uh, what is a piano? What is a piano? <laughs> you've, you've prepped that question to just launch into, haven't you? <laughs> Absolutely. So, I can tell you how a piano gets its name. Um, so, piano in Italian means soft. And uh, its full name, it's not actually its full name, its full name is pianoforte. And forte means loud in Italian. So, its actual name means a soft loud. And then, of course, the question is, why on earth is it called a soft loud? And the answer is, before pianos were invented, the previous kind of keyboard instrument was called a harpsichord. And in a harpsichord, the uh, strings that produce the sound are plucked. A hammer comes down and plucks, um, like it's got a little hook on it, and it plucks the strings. And you, no matter how hard you hit the keys, it doesn't change volume because you can't affect how the, 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 um, the, the hook is plucking the string. But in a piano, when the hammer comes down, it hits the string which is why it's technically a percussion instrument. People think of it as something else, but it's a percussion. It's part of the drums family. It's a percussion uh, instrument because the strings are being hit by a hammer and you can affect how loud that happens because it depends on how fast the hammer comes down. So when you hit a key gently on a piano, it makes a soft sound. And when you hit a key hard on a piano, it makes a loud sound, which is why it's called a soft loud, otherwise known as a pianoforte. And what is a piano for you? It's everything. Right? It, it allows me to produce um, musical memories for other people. If I'm playing, you know, really sp pieces of music that are special to them. Um, it allows me to facilitate teaching. It allows me to get people playing an instrument that commonly they've spent many decades thinking they would never be able to play. It allows me to perform. It allows me to, you know, um, allows me to share moments with my wife. You know, she likes to sing and whilst I play the piano. So yeah, it's, it does so much. There's a, I don't know if you've seen the Disney film Soul, um, have you not? Okay, there's, no. a, there's a beautiful moment where the, the, the music teacher plays the piano and they show um, him going into complete flow and everything around him stops. Uh, the world stops moving. Um, and, and the whole film is around, you know, finding what gives you the most soul, um, finding where your soul is at peace. And for this, this musical teacher, it's the piano and everything. When, when he plays it, the whole room, room sort of trans, transcends. I, if you haven't seen it, I think you'd love it. Um, yeah. But I'd love to hear what, what the, describe the moment when you play those keys, what happens in your world? And how would you describe that exact feeling, if, if, at all, if it's yeah. possible? It's really interesting because someone asked me a similar question last night. And it was the first time I'd been ever asked to sort of analyze this moment. And I had to confess that in the last couple of weeks, I've been sort of undergoing a little bit of a change in how I feel about playing piano, which might sound a bit strange after all this time. So I started playing piano when I was five. And now I'm 43. So this is just as long as life is, itself is in my in my own mind. So I don't remember a time before piano. Um, and because I took to it really quickly and kind of passed my piano grades, as they're called, by the age of 12, I got my grade eight when I was 12, I'd sort of not mastered the instrument, but I'd sort of got to a, a decent level before I even had the chance to be old enough to rebel about it. So I had like football and girls and rock music, even then still hadn't happened. And I'd kind of got my grades, they were done. So piano had come really automatically to me. And so it was really natural that I would try and do something with it as a career. But when you become what's sometimes referred to as a working musician, so working musicians could be people who teach instrumentally one-to-one, -one, or they could be people who go and perform at weddings, at corporate events, or whatever it might be. People who are working musicians, it's something that they do as a profession. You, it's, it's very easy for that to become quite stale because you've just married together your profession and your, theory, your hobby, and it's become this one amalgamous mass that you sort of start to wonder what you feel about. And it's quite, um, it's quite easy to lose a bit of the magic because you are going to work. And I guess we all, even though we, we like to um, make a living doing something we enjoy, it's very easy for it, something such as music, which is so like intrinsically hobby-based for so many people, it's very, it's very easy for the, the boundaries to become blurred between what is work and what, what is joy. And so I'll not lie, I have played countless weddings and events and corporate events purely mechanically like without thinking about it I mean, even if people coming up for requests and and asking for something they love and i play it and they could be moved or, you know tearful or happy or dance or whatever it might be that emotional response to music 
has been very difficult to tap into for me because I've just become so used to facilitating that without thinking about it. But in the last couple of weeks, I've really started to try and revisit the origin of why I do what I do or the purpose of why I do what I do. I had a coach, my first personal development coach in my life. It really started to force me to think about what's my mission, what's my purpose. And I've literally just put it out to the universe in the last week. I want to help 1 million people access piano playing before I'm done. Now I think about it, I've been teaching piano since I was 15, so I reckon I'm already blown a hole in it. But I think it's good to have this kind of, this goal to remind me that what I'm doing, which is why when you said, what was your first question, your first question, what is piano? It is all of these other things. It's not just playing an instrument. It is facilitating mine and other people's emotional responses. It's facilitating all other kinds of more esoteric things and emotional things. And so I'd kind of forgotten I think I had forgotten a little bit about the magic, about when I was playing, it was very automatic. You know, I could be reading football stuff on the internet on my iPad whilst I was playing and just not even thinking about it. But in the last week or two, when I've been playing a lot, particularly on Clubhouse, I've been really consciously having a conversation with myself. Look, this is great what you're facilitating. Yeah, look at the joy you're bringing people. Look at the experiences and the, the moments that you're bringing people. And uh, I feel like I've kind of reconnected with it a bit and it's it's great, I love it. And uh, how, how do you feel in that moment when you are playing in, purely for joy? There's no mechanical element to it. Do you, does, 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 does time slow down for you? Do you, um, do you find yourself entrenched into the music or have you, or, or have you gone too far, too far past that now? I don't know, actually. I've, someone that had a conversation with me a few weeks ago about uh, getting into the flow and I had to report back that I didn't really know what that meant. I'm, yeah. I was. Just, it's so automatic to me that I, I wasn't really sure. Perhaps, perhaps I'm con constantly in the <laughs> in the floor, or perhaps I've long since passed it. I'm not entirely sure um, because, like I say, I can't remember a time before it. Um, but I think I do uh, because I'm having to wear earphones quite a lot when I'm playing on Clubhouse, just to make sure the sound is as good as I can make it. I do quite like playing with headphones because I feel like it's a bit more immersive. Um, and I can sort of connect with it a bit. And I do sort of enjoy the mechanics of it. Um, I like, I get the biggest kick out of playing songs that people don't expect that you can play. So whether it's dance tunes or whether it's metal stuff or like someone today literally asked me to play the theme tune to Sesame Street. And I'd never played that before. So I just quickly stuck it on YouTube and played it by ear. And I do quite like the, the challenge and I like the element of surprise going, I bet you've never heard it like this before and playing something and they go, wow, I, I recognize that tune. Oh, wow. I can't believe you're playing that, you know, club tune from the nineties or something. So I, I do quite, I quite like the element of surprise. And when I get, when I do that kind of thing, then I get a kick out of it. When people ask me to play like Adele or like Coldplay or Elton John, it's, it's great. And I and I'm enjoying the fact that they're having a nice moment and they're emotional about it or whatever it might be. But it's it's expected on piano yeah. to play that stuff. But I quite like the the element of surprise. How did you get past the the teenage years then? Because that's the that's probably the period where most people fall off. Like I I, I was one of those. Like I I played the piano up till I got till grade five till about twelve thirteen, and then I stopped for a few years. Then I thought I revisited it. I did grade six, and then I never touched it again. And it was yeah. one of those things where things get in the way, or you just start your your interest starts fuzzling out. Um, the love that you had before starts to go. How did you survive those teenage years and take it into your adult adult life? I think I started trying to write my own music more. Okay. I, I, I taught myself sort of basic acoustic guitar, you know, and, and I got really into rock music. So I kind of like tried to do the whole sort of tortured teenage uh, angsty, yes, let's write some some angsty songs. But um, yeah, I, I got a lot more into to writing songs. And also what some people don't realize is that if you do study the sort of traditional exam board um, qualifications, it's very much classical in nature. And there's a whole world of music that never gets touched in that field. And so I remember being sort of 13, 14, looking at endless books of pop stuff, They're sometimes known as busker books or fake books, but it's like a sort of musical shorthand. So the idea is that there's quite small books and buskers can take them around and throw them in their guitar case. And it's a style of musical notation that's very chord based, which just isn't co covered at all in the grades. And I felt, I felt like I was able to sort of access a, another style of learning to play. And I sort of pretty much did that a lot of that myself. Um, but yeah, I was writing, you know, teenage songs that I'm sure were pretty rubbish. But um, I, I kind of got into that quite a bit and sort of found other areas to explore. Using it to impress your mates and uh, impress the girls then. 
well, yeah, but of course there is a fundamental pecking order in music. The guitarists are cooler than piano players, and it's just unavoidable. Um, <laughs> so you have to wrestle with that and have to come to terms with it. Why the uh, bias towards piano when you when you start to explore the different instruments? Do you do you do you think that the benefits that you gain from piano are different to other instruments, or is piano just become your your sort of choice? Yeah, I mean, piano, there was no alternative. I mean, there was a piano in my house when I was a kid. And apparently when I was like very, very, very little, I was reaching up to the keys. And so it yeah. seemed to be quite interesting, the fact that I could get a sound out of it. Because that's one of the great things about piano. Like it, literally anyone could get a sound out of it. You just hit it. Um, so it's not quite like something like a saxophone, which is quite difficult to get a sound out of. Um, so by the time things I got a bit older and I was like, well, teaching myself to play guitar. I genuinely really wanted to be a rock star. And of course, all rock stars play guitars and piano is just not very cool in Rockland. Um, but even though I loved playing guitar, I knew I was having to think about it. It wasn't automatic to me. I mean, I can still play a bit of guitar now. I've just recorded some guitar on an album last year, but the um, I'm having to think when I play guitar. I'm never going to be a natural guitarist. Whereas piano, that's much more automatic to me. And uh, you actually did. Like, enter, you entered a rock band. Um, you, you're in one now, right now called Winter Winter Fire. Winter Phyllis. Winter Winter Phyllis. Phyllis. Yeah. Of course, I've actually got a Winter Phyllis t-shirt on I today. Noticed that, yeah. Actually, I, I don't. Right, what what a tacky thing today. I didn't actually realise that I had it on today. Yeah, I do. So I'm in a band called Winter Phyllis. Yeah. And how, how did that come about then? Uh, so I have spent a lot of my career um, coaching and conducting choirs, like community choirs. Okay. So I, I spend a, a lot of my time arranging pop and rock stuff for choirs um, and I've conducted choirs of up to 300 singers so I'm really used to being in front of big choirs and so I kind of got a bit of a reputation as being a bit of a quote-unquote choir master and like really obsessed by vocal harmonies and stuff so I um, got asked almost as almost like a consultant <laughs> sounds strange to say but um, Winterfell were guys I'd come into contact when they'd already made about three records um, and I was researching my PhD and the subjects that Winterfell write about, which is very sort of Anglo-Saxon uh, history and and myths and so on, uh, was part a big part of my PhD. And um, so I was in contact with Chris, particularly the singer, and uh, asking him questions about the lyrics and the source material. And uh, we ended up chatting, and he said, "Oh, we're recording a a, a new album. We'd like some help with the vocal harmonies. Can you want to come down to the studio and help us out and and see how we get on, kind of thing?" So I went in just as like as an extra in the studio at first. But because I can do harmonies really, really quickly, they were like, oh, wow, this is like saving us a day of recording because they would have me work it all out by ear. And I was like, sing this one, sing this one, sing this one. And they're like, oh, done, half an hour, next. So we and we ended up getting really, really, uh, getting on really well as friends. So uh, by the time the next record came around, I was in the band and I'm still there now. Fantastic. How do you, how do you balance those contrasts? Because I like in the introduction of your book, you say, you know, life gets quite varied for you. And... You know, on the surface, when you see a, a, you, you call yourself a piano coach, on the surface, you just think, oh, he just teaches piano. When you dig in a bit deeper, there's all sorts of things you're doing. And it's, it's it crosses the whole realm of music that goes beyond just being the typical piano teacher. How, how, yeah, did, you, how, how did you craft that? Because you often think of the piano teacher as the, as the annoying, boring person that tells you off after your <laughs> lessons. And it gives you less, it gives you homework to do that you don't want to do. And then you get told off the next time. That's the sort of stereotypical piano teacher. Yeah, You've kind of broken that mold. Yeah, very much. Um... I'm a, I'm a heavy metal fan at heart. Like yes. that, that is where I'm at. So my PhD is in heavy metal, in, in extreme heavy metal at that, actually. So my PhD is called uh, National Identity in Northern and Eastern European Heavy Metal. So oh. I, am, I am metal to the bone in a very geeky academic way. So, um, yeah, I mean, that kind of music is where my heart is at. Um, but there's also, of course, a big part of my heart that is piano. So I'm just, I just do what I love. So whether I love coaching choirs, I love listening to black metal and, and, and being in a black metal band, and I love helping people play piano. So I, I do them all. I don't see the reason to stop any of them. Yeah, and in the book, you you kind of dispel a lot of myths around piano. There's Again, it's, there's a lot of sort of boring, stereotypical myths like scales and theory and sight reading. And that, when I think of piano, my, my early days of piano, I just think of you know doing C major scales, trying to learn how to sight read, and then having to do theory with it all. You've broken down a lot of these myths to make it a lot more accessible, and it's it kind of ties into your your big mission. So before we go into the big mission and the myths, um, how does how does piano actually improve your, your well being? Because again, another thing you're doing different is you're not saying I'm going to teach you how to play the piano. You're saying I'm going to teach you. How, I'm going to improve your mental health. I'm going to improve your well being. So absolutely. piano is just one of the ways I do it. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad you asked that because this is something that over the last year or so has become a big part of my thought process that. 
I came became increasingly aware that both through my choir work with community choirs and my piano teaching, 99% of the people I come into contact with are amateurs. They, they have no interest whatsoever in becoming a professional singer or a professional piano player. This is something they're doing for, for joy. And I've spent you know 20 plus years around these kind of people. And what I really had started to clock was the language I use around these people in terms of encouraging them to, to, to practice or encouraging them to make a part of their daily routine and tips and tricks that I have to make sure that they don't feel like they have to sit there for hours. Just, I, I talk about it in 15 minute blocks. When, I, when you talk about music in this way, whatever your musical hobby is, it's very much in the same languages that we use around meditation and mindfulness and well-being, which is having 15 minutes a day to do something just for you that calms you down, that reduces anxiety, where it's a positive distraction from all the stresses of life, be they financial or family or ill health or whatever it may be. And just doing something which means that you are not going to be worrying about other things at the same time. When you're trying to worry about which finger is going to go down the piano, you are not worrying about your electricity bill. It's just not happening. You've got too much to think about. You might then worry about it again afterwards. But for those 15 minutes, it's a distraction to the point where I've recently had a client who has an eating disorder who had been binge eating every day for a year before she became one of my clients. And in probably what is now in nearly three months, she hasn't binge eaten once because every time she feels the urge as she puts it, she goes and sits at the players at the piano. Now, does she ever have any ambitions to become a professional piano player? No. Do I have any medical training to explain why that's happening? No. But all I can do is report anecdotal evidence. And the anecdotal evidence that I hear time and time and time and time again is that when you think about music in this way of just enjoying the process without any kind of pretensions that you're going to be there for um, years in order to become a professional pianist, when you just get strip it down to what it is, it's a hobby for fun. And if you do a little bit each day, you just feel better. It's really interesting on the eating disorder. You've never made that connection. Have you... Have you, have you thought of like why that may be the case? Or do you think it's literally as simple as you just feel better so you don't have the need to overeat? No, it's the other way. She uses it as, as a, an active distraction. When okay. she feels she wants to overeat, she sits at the piano and the urge goes away. I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know why that may be. Sorry to interrupt you, but I, when I, re, I spoke to a doctor about this recently and said, you know, I find this incredible. And I, or perhaps she was a psychiatrist or something of that nature. And she didn't seem as surprised as I was yeah. but because of the element of positive distraction. And it's just taking the mind away into mindfully doing something else and, and until it passes. It's extraordinary. What would be interesting to, is to understand if the, the, the positive benefit she gets from playing is helping her deal with the underlying issue that's triggering her to overeat sure. that would be sure. really interesting to kind of explore and there probably is an element to that as well in that she's getting some level of healing from it yeah i mean she literally sent me a message that just said piano has saved my life yeah i mean how how much more of a testimonial do i want but this is i don't i don't honestly think this positions me as the greatest piano teacher in the world but i think i've got a slightly unusual way of presenting what it is that you're doing to to strip away as what you say I refer to in the book, which is quite true, the myths around learning an instrument or learning to play a piano. You don't have to be putting yourself through the rigmarole of all of these exercises and these kind of endless books which make adults try and play Frere Jacques in nursery rhymes. Who on earth thinks that's a good idea? And I know there are people who've paid a lot of money for some high level piano courses. Um, in fact, I heard a story the other day where someone had paid fifteen hundred pounds for a piano course which is normally three thousand pounds and was proudly telling me that in the first two months they could play all their major and minor scales and i was like well what's that going to get you i mean yes great you can play some skills how many songs can you play how much joy are you getting out of playing endless exercises mm -hmm. so i think there's that's nothing to say against scales or against classical music far from it but there's more than one way to skin a cat when it comes to learning an instrument and most people don't want to become a pro. So let's not put them through the hoops, which would help you become a pro if we don't need to. If they want to play scales, great. But there's more to it than that. So what are some of the other myths that uh, perpetuate what you do? I don't have time. That's the, that's the biggest nonsense. You do. You just don't want to enough. So I have to find a way to make you want to enough. But I think a big part of the I don't have time argument is because people associate needing to practice hours for it. Yeah. 
and and that's that's a, it comes back to this idea well yes if you want to become a pro then you're probably gonna need to spend hours but 99 percent of the people i come into contact with they just want 15 minutes chill out after work to unwind well so only play for 15 minutes then we're not looking to make you something that you don't want to be let's make sure we're comparing apples with apples so that's a big one i don't have time then there's the ones that are like oh my fingers are too fat my fingers are too short that rubbish it's, it's just i mean that's literal rubbish but it's just a mantra people have been telling themselves since they were a child that's yeah. a good one um i'm too old also rubbish maybe too old to become a pro because you're going to spend 20 years and hours a day but if that's not what you're wanting, then again, this is a pointless argument. So I've got clients in their 80s, hmm. literally in their 80s, saying, I wish I'd been taught like this 60 years ago. Because the goal wasn't right. I ask people to identify what their piano why is. If your why is to keep your fingers nimble in retirement and to have something pleasant to do instead of going for endless walks or just an alternative hobby, then let's approach it in that way. Let's approach it with that goal in mind. So it's all about the reason why we're doing it. That's a really crucial point. How do you, um, in 15 minutes, how do you get someone to feel like they're competent in what they do? Because competency can play a good part in so wanting to do more. How do you build that competency really quick? It's about quick wins. You know, it's just like coaching in a lot, in a lot of other fields. You know, it's about having a little bit of a childlike sense of adventure. Yeah. Evaluating what our goal is and remembering that if the distance from a beginner to a professional is is a big distance and the, the distance we're actually trying to get is much smaller we're trying to get you from like you say a, a competent level to be able to play recognizable tunes and most people when they listen to themselves play they're not expecting to play it like me or another professional straight away they recognize that that is a big distance but that doesn't mean to say that we can't have pleasure in the smaller steps so it's about getting quick wins it's about leaving yourself wanting more i say to people you know if you get to the end of 15 minutes and you're thinking, oh, I could quite keep, fancy keep going, but you've just done something that you've got correct, walk away because you're going to be busting to get back the next time. If you sit for a bit longer, you will eventually get to a bit that you can't do. And the last thing you remember when you walk away is going to, oh, yeah, that was a failure. I couldn't do that. And you just, you won't want to go back. So it's about keeping it within defined parameters, quick wins, and the momentum will take care of itself. Maybe um, with that very first bit of, of when you first started this journey of, of trying to learn the piano, what does it look like from, do you have, what's your unique methodology when it comes to like learning the first steps? Are you teaching people, this is C, this is B, this is D, or are you getting people to tune in with the sounds of the different notes? So how do you get literally that first, first because I'm only using my experiences. My experience yeah. is scales and then it's, you know, learning from a, a book and they, you know, you learn bar at a time to piece together a song. Do you use a different methodology? If so, like how, what are some of the over, overview? Uh, I try points? and like com combine a range of ways so that people's different learning styles are taken care of. So hard on heart, would I love everyone to be able to read music who comes into contact with my stuff? Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Because if they can read the music, this is going to be a lot easier. But, you know, I recognize that musical notation is not the easiest thing for everyone to get their head around. And that's absolutely fine. So let's find other ways that people can access it. So in my setup, which you, you can see right now, the camera over my head, which is going to look down on the keys. So they've got a direct line down. So if worse comes to worse, just do what my fingers do. And of course, I'm going to, in all the videos that I do, that everything's slowed down. Say, right, this is what this little bit sounds like on the left hand. This is what this little bit sounds like on the right hand. This is what it sounds like slower. So if worse comes to the worst, follow my fingers. Now, sometimes it's not very easy to see what my fingers are doing because, you know, it, it's not necessarily easily discernible with the white and black keys. So on my videos, I have a software piano that's vertically lined up with the real piano that lights up with the key that I'm pressing. So now you can either look at my hands and work out what finger I'm pressing or look at the key that's lighting up. Now we've got two ways to access the material and we still haven't introduced the written music yet. Then on the screen also, we've got some written music with things being circled and saying, right, so when you press this note, circled. So now we've got like different connections being made. And I also provide all the downloads of the sheet music to, to print out as well. So we've kind of got everything covered in terms of ways you can access it. And if you really don't want to learn to read the music, yeah, copy my fingers and look at the keys lighting up and make it a game if you wish. I, I just want to make it accessible in whatever way I can. So it's really up to the individual to decide which way works best for them. Yeah, it's really interesting. And from that, I'm assuming they can play small little pieces and then into songs and, and, and yeah, absolutely. the momentum then builds and takes care of itself. I tend to try and give people some quick wins again by 
teaching them how to play little hooks or just little riffs. So I'll say, right, this video is all about getting you to play the riff to imagine. Like, let's not worry about the whole song. Let's just play the bit that it's going to get everyone happy so that now they can play the riff to imagine. Because, and the way I explain to people is, if you're at a party, remember when parties were a thing? If you're at a party and there's a piano there and someone says, oh, you can play piano, they don't want you to give a full performance. They just want you to sit down, play the riff to imagine or whatever it is, and then have another drink and then talk about the weather. They just want like 20 or 30 seconds and the kick that you get of being able to play little bits of, you know, instantly recognizable bits of songs, that could bring a lot of joy to people. It doesn't matter that you necessarily couldn't sit down and do a half hour set of Beatles music. Let's just give you some quick wins. And yeah, of course, as my stuff gets more complex, then we're looking at longer bits. But I, I focus on giving people some quick wins, first of all. What's some of the most popular riffs that you get asked to, um, to teach? That I get, or to teach? Or you, um, or you get asked to, to, yeah. to do, yeah, go on. So like things like uh, this one. That's a big one, the Thousand yeah. Years riff from Vanessa Carlton. Um, there's uh, the Walking in Memphis. that one um there's things like uh, uh someone like you adele it's a big one um clocks by uh coldplay it's a big one uh, all of me john legend so yeah we can do this all day there's just endless riffs one of the ones i like to play is the robert miles children riff It's an old dance tune, so it's a really flexible instrument. It's been used in so many iconic songs over the years. Awesome. Do you um do you attach singing to it as well? Not in my teaching. So I I do have my I've got a, a community choir company called Sing United. I've got 150 singers in Newcastle, uh, yeah. where I'm based, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's very much singing based. And I'm playing piano and conducting them and arranging them all in five and six part harmony. But in my piano teaching, my piano coaching work, no, it's just just piano. Fantastic. Um, on the in the book as well, you mention um, physical health benefits of uh, of piano, which I found quite interesting. Do you want to elaborate a little bit more about what what piano can do for your physical health? Yeah. So I say I, I don't come at this from any kind of medical background. I just sort of do a bit of research and ask ask for people who don't do know about it to tell me. So people talk about neuroplasticity and the sort of teaching the brain new tricks and keeping it active and. I know that I've got some clients who use piano playing in their older years because they feel it helps with arthritis. And so it's just kind of um, joint maneuvering and hand-eye coordination. It's got a range of kind of things that it's really, really useful for. Based on that neuroplasticity argument, do you find kids can learn quicker because they're more susceptible to learning? Or do you think, again, this is just a myth that it's being perpetuated? So funnily enough, I don't teach children and have, I have taught okay. children many years ago, but I, I don't, I haven't taught young children in probably, I don't know, 15 or 20 years. Um, Cause I just get a bigger kick out of the frustrated adults and getting them over that first step. Um, but yeah, I think there probably is some truth in that, but I think part of the kind of payoff to that or the trade-off of that is that, um, you know, kids sometimes can be made to feel like they're doing it because they have to. Because, you know, not every kid is going to want to learn to play piano, and that's fine. So I think part of the fun with adults is if they're doing it, they're probably going to want to do it. Um, but the, the balance is to make sure that you're giving them enough quick wins to keep them motivated. Because adults can get up and walk away from the piano stool. And kids are probably going to stay put for at least five minutes if you tell them. Well, this is the thing around the, the, the quick wins. Without those quick wins, after about four to six weeks, once that honeymoon period is over... Yeah. That's where I'm assuming you find the most resistance with people. And it's, the trick is to really get them get them into that three, four, five, six months and, and beyond. How do you how do you what sort of tricks do you use to build the habit of practice, of learning, making it part of your lifestyle? Is it something you tell them to do daily? Is it something to tell them to do three times a week? What what are your sort of habit stacking tricks here to keep people beyond that initial honeymoon period? So I've got a, a workshop that is literally called How to Fit Learning to Play Piano in 15 Minutes a Day. So that is where I sort of go, right, here are all the tricks. Because sometimes the tips need to be how to make it a routine, how to make it a habit, how to actually fit it into your life. And then sometimes the tips are, right, now you're sat at the piano. How are we going to get you some quick wins in 15 minutes? And how are we going to make sure that you want to come back the next time? So I tend to say to people, try and get one 15-minute block in the day. If you are desperate and you're having a great time, do it twice, but in, a in two separate blocks, like one in the morning, one in the evening, whatever it might be. Um, don't set unrealistic goals. So don't say, you know, I am going to play for three hours on Saturday. It's nonsense. You're going to set yourself up for a fail 
and you will end up feeling that you have failed in inverted commas if you only do two hours, which is ridiculous. Um, don't say that you're going to play for seven days a week because life will get in the way. Something will happen with the job or the family or the fam, whatever it might be. So I say sweet spot, five days a week, 15 minutes a day. If you can get six days a week, great. And if any one of those days you happen to do more than one 15 minute block, great. But just keep them in those small bite-sized chunks. Yeah, I love it. Another thing I um, I was thinking of just now is like, what do you say to people who say, "Oh, I need all the space. I need uh, I need to get all these equipment ready. I need to do, find the best the best equipment." Do you, do you have very simple? And do you, how do you make it very accessible in terms of space, uh, price points, etc.? Yeah. I've got links set up ready to go. So I don't want. In fact, I sometimes spend hours looking on Facebook Marketplace and eBay and Gumtree and stuff for people to find them. Like just, I literally say in some emails, "Send me your postcode. I will find something." Because I don't want there to be any any obstacle. Because people will put a barrier in the way. Oh, well, you know, yeah. I just I don't even have a keyboard. Like it's impossible to buy one. <laughs> let's but let's solve that. I'll send you a link in two minutes, and you'll be done. And in terms of the price points, you know, people think you spend thousands. You don't. The the most common beginner setup that I send people right now is one hundred and ninety pounds, and that will last you for years. You could do with it like a stool and maybe some headphones, but certainly less than 300 pounds you will be set for years if someone is listening right now and they're thinking oh this sounds really interesting like i want to I've, I've always thought about playing an instrument playing the piano what's their first step and uh what can you tell them right now to push them over the line and get them in part of your mission send me a message like it's it's just a conversation so i don't want you i don't want there to be any barriers so that i'm too old is rubbish that my fingers are too short or fat or whatever is rubbish. Um, you don't have to play classical music. You don't have to play scales. You don't have to play endless exercises. You don't have to play for hours a day. It doesn't take 20 years to play music that you love. Like all of these things are just factually not true. And I've spent my lifetime proving it to people. So the first step, just send me a message, send me an email, go look for Mark Deke's music or look for the hashtag that piano guy anywhere you like. And set, let's have a conversation because the first step could be just literally, you know, let have a look at my book, not another piano book. It could just be, um, you know, I'll send you a, f a free sample of a lesson. It could just be, let's have a chat and can you recommend me some keyboards? Whatever it might be, like I will facilitate any of these things because I don't want them to be a barrier. Fantastic. And where can people find you then, Mark? So on all my social channels, it's Mark Dick's Music or search for the hashtag that piano guy. Um, or you can go to my website, um, which I'm just in the process of moving for, to a new domain, which is thatpianoguy.club. Awesome. Yeah, we'll put those uh, in the show notes. Uh, to wrap up, uh, what is your favorite piano piece? Uh, that doesn't feel it, mechanical to you after all these years. People ask me this a lot, so it, dep it depends. <laughs> I, I, I alternate. So sometimes I say the Robert Miles tune. Sometimes I said that. Sometimes I like to play um, a tune called uh, Teardrop by Massive Attack, which was like in the late 90s, a big song. That wasn't originally a piano, right? Uh, the one I guess that is was originally a piano riff and I still love to play uh, is by an Icelandic band called Sigur Ross and the track's called Hoppy Podler and it was made famous. It was already a famous song, but brought to more mainstream attention on the uh, David Attenborough uh, show uh, Planet Earth, which is this one. So yeah, I like playing that one too. It was a uh, very smooth, very soothing listening to that already. Thank you. Every morning I um I know you, I know you talked about the classical music uh, sort of stereotype, but I actually do all my deep work to uh, to Chopin and oh, uh, okay. Nocturne's uh, B flat minor is a song I play on on repeat really? for for hours and hours and hours for up to about three four hours, and it just ends wow. up being just like part of the the white noise in the background, but. 
that's the that's the one that's the music i always uh i play on repeat that i couldn't stand the same piece of music on repeat for three or four hours that would drive me to really? yeah. it works really well when you're trying to get in when you're just doing like writing or you're doing deep work and it just it'd be because then it doesn't become a distraction um but yeah i just thought i'd mention that no it's interesting how everyone's mind works in different ways yeah yeah. Um, fantastic. Just to finish up, last uh, last point. What's the most surprising benefit you've had from uh, your coaching outside of the eating disorder one? What's, what's been I mean, some... that was the ultimate one. Like, I could, okay. I, I, I nearly fell off my chair when I first had that. For, it was extraordinary. But there was a client who said that she was convinced in the, within a week of playing, she was sleeping better. She had 15 minutes a day and she was convinced that she was sleeping better, wake up the next morning more refreshed. And of course, what are the spin-off benefits of that? Being more present with your family, with your job or whatever it might be. So yeah, th things like that are not uncommon. They happen a lot. Fantastic. So the listeners, if you're, if you're looking for a new way to carve out some more me time, uh, to take back, some, take back some of your day and explore a new hobby, Mark is the man to teach you the piano. Thanks Thank for coming on, Mark. Much. Really appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you.